In my previous videos, I discussed the extensive Christian, and more specifically Catholic, themes and symbolisms found in Final Fantasy XV. The subject under discussion this time, in contrast, is nearly as far from Catholicism as one can imagine. Given that the book we're discussing, Dawn of the Future, was written as a Final Fantasy XV expansion, this may seem rather odd. But incredibly, the novel's worldview is diametrically opposed to that of the game proper. It trades the original game's Catholic influence for Gnostic influence. Before we can fully appreciate the extent of this breach, however, it is important to both define Gnosticism and consider the game's own attitude towards it. Unlike Catholicism, Gnosticism rarely identifies itself by name. In fact, those who have heard the term Gnosticism but lack sufficient understanding of its core principles likely consider it to have disappeared a millennia and a half ago. Those who are aware of these principles, however, can recognize them in the most unlikely of places. To better understand Gnostic thought, then, let's consider the work of the philosopher Eric Vogelin. Vogelin traced Gnosticism's sordid history in the 19th and 20th centuries, exploring its influence on the most active ideologies of the period. Fascism, Nazism, Socialism, Communism, Nihilism, Positivism, and Progressivism, and providing a concise overview of the core Gnostic principles that link those seemingly unrelated ideologies. The aim of Gnosticism, Vogelin explained, is to destroy the order of being, which is experienced as defective and unjust, and through man's creative power, to replace it with a perfect and just order. When analyzed in light of this framework, all of the referenced ideologies demonstrate the same basic pattern. Gnosticism, then, is no mere curiosity. As Vogelin explains, to destroy the order of being is tantamount to the murder of God, which is why the success of Gnostic ideology inevitably breeds disaster. The history of the 20th century brutally illustrates Vogelin's claim that the deicide of the Gnostic theoreticians is followed by the homicide of the revolutionary practitioners. Vogelin links this pernicious desire to destroy God with the mythological figure of Prometheus, a figure which, not coincidentally, haunts both Final Fantasy XV and Dawn of the Future. So what sort of figure is Prometheus, exactly? On the one hand, Prometheus was a divine benefactor of humanity. His myths portray him crafting man from clay, bestowing fire and civilization on mankind, ensuring human access to the most nutritious meat, and recovering fire from mankind after its loss. On the other hand, Prometheus's boons towards humanity frequently flew in the face of divine order. In fact, it was Prometheus's decision to secure the benefit of meat for humanity at Zeus's expense that cost humanity access to fire. As such, when Prometheus stole fire, he did so in defiance of divine judgment. For this disobedience, Prometheus faced an exceptionally cruel punishment. He was chained to a rock and left to suffer indefinitely, harried by an eagle who daily tore out his immortal liver. While the core elements of the Prometheus myth have remained largely unchanged through the centuries, its interpretation has shifted wildly. Post-Enlightenment, Prometheus is most often seen not as the tragic and ambiguous figure of antiquity, but rather as a hero of revolution and a martyr for progress. And it is this modern understanding of Prometheus to which Vogelin ties the Gnostic rejection of divine order. It is no exaggeration to say that Final Fantasy XV's treatment of its Prometheus figures says all that needs to be said about its attitude towards Gnosticism as a whole. The first and most obvious echo of Prometheus is the figure of Ifrit, a god who grants both fire and civilization to mankind. Ifrit presents no neat reflection of Prometheus, however, and the changes made to the Promethean archetype are both interesting and telling. Ifrit's boon to humanity, unlike that of Prometheus, remains entirely within the divine order, and the other astrals become more sympathetic to mankind as a result of his assistance. Rebellion may play a role in Ifrit's downfall, but this rebellion begins not with a rogue god choosing to favor man, but with the determination of man to overthrow the gods. To some extent, the downfall of Solheim portrays a conflict between the ancient Prometheus and the modern one, at the expense of both. While Ifrit is ultimately laid low for defying the divine order, his defiance lies not in his initial favor but in his subsequent attempt to destroy mankind. The overall impression given by Ifrit's myth, then, is very different from the impression given by the Prometheus myth. 
Final Fantasy XV's mythos implies no inherent tension between human progress and the divine order. In fact, it is the rejection of that order that brings man and God into mortal conflict. Furthermore, it is interesting to note that the divinity-defying empire's influence is not limited to the past. The Niflheim Empire explicitly seeks to replicate the perceived glory of Solheim. This dynamic is expressed most forcefully in the game's depiction of Erstdale, the mad scientist who despises human limitations and explicitly seeks to challenge the gods. Versdale's attempt to improve upon humanity over against the Divine Order serves as a perfect illustration of Vogelin's insight that the attempt to create Superman is an attempt to murder man, and thus of the game's deep suspicion of the modern Promethean archetype. Aspects of the Prometheus myth are also present in the figure of Arden, an immortal doomed to unending suffering following a misguided attempt to provide a boon to mankind. Episode Arden mostly canon offshoot of Dawn of the Future that it is, expands these parallels further by revealing that Arden, like Prometheus, was bound to stone and left in constant agony for millennia. Arden's response to his suffering only amplifies the similarity. I hate all the gods could fall just as comfortably from his lips as from those of the ill-fated Greek deity. And in the end, his violent rebellion against the gods he despises and the homicidal swath of destruction he carves to attain it reflects the ultimate danger of the modern Prometheus. Arden is, of course, far too important a character to gloss over in a single paragraph. More importantly, Arden the Promethean provides an ideal point of departure for exploring Dawn of the Future's Gnostic tendencies. A full analysis of his characterization in the novel should provide significant insight into the novel's worldview. Next time on Akeen Investigates.